when I go to my grocer and I buy a gallon of milk for $3, I say, look, if you will give me title to that gallon of milk, I will give you title to this $3. I will exchange these titles. So the, the essence of exchange is the transfer of property rights. This is one of the problems that black Americans face. That is, many of us... We feel that we can achieve salvation through the political arena. That is, by putting a black person in charge of our lives. And if you ask the question... In what cities in our country do black people receive the worst education? Are most insecure in their lives, live under rotten conditions. They are the very cities where a black is the mayor, the chief of police, the superintendent of schools. And I'm not saying that there's a causal relationship between that, but I'm saying that there's not much salvation to be achieved through the political arena. My guest is Professor Walter Williams. Uh, he is an economics professor, teaches at George Mason if University. If I say to the federal government, I will pay my share of the, of the constitutional, constitutionally mandated functions of the federal government, I will be happily, but I will not have my earnings go to farmers, go to bail at big banks. You'll see all the intimidation, threats, and oppression Absolutely. that I would want but, to see. I mean, see. I think America, America meets any, any normal person's basic mm -hmm. definition of we are living in a free society here. This is not Plato's Republic. This is not the Soviet Union. We're not living in a free society. What I mean by spiritual poverty is where people lack the ambition. They've, uh, they've developed the ideas of dependency and they're engaging in all kinds of uh, uh, pathological behavior, such as uh, the high illegitimacy rate where 70-some percent of black kids are born out of wedlock. Uh, and it was like in 1940, it was only 13 percent. If you tax something, you're going to get less of it. And if you subsidize it, you're going to get more of it. And what we've been doing is subsidizing slovenly behavior. Today, in ghettos like I grew up in, 70% of black children who look for jobs cannot find them. That's a shame, because a first job means much more than pocket change. It's a chance for a start. They're even more important for kids who grew up in broken homes, who've gone to rotten schools, because if they're going to learn anything that will make them a more valuable worker in the future, they're not going to learn in their neighborhoods. They're not going to learn in their schools. So they have to learn it through on the job. And what the minimum wage law does, it nixes that learning. A lot of people will say, well, the minimum wage is an anti-poverty device. Well, that is utter nonsense. It doesn't even pass the smell test. Because if it were an anti-poverty device, well then, instead of spending all this money on foreign aid, we just have our experts at the State Department tell Bangladesh, well, you could be rich like we are, just have a higher minimum wage. I often tell people that I am very, very happy that I got virtually all of my education before it became fashionable for white people to like black people. So what that meant is that when I got a C, it was an honest to God C. When I got an A, it was an honest to God A. They weren't practicing affirmative action and they didn't give a damn about my self-esteem. Affirmative action uh, is one of the most effective uh, means, I believe, of reinforcing uh, racial stereotypes. Racism in our country could have earned a well-deserved death, but it has been uh, resurrected by race hustlers, or poverty pimps, I call them, uh, such as Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and many others in the civil rights movement who make a living on the grievances of blacks. If you take a poor, uh, illiterate Italian in 1920s, and if he wanted to get into the taxicab business, all he had to do was buy a used car and write the word taxi on it, and lo and behold, he was in business making money. Today, it's entirely different. Unlike the early 20th century, many cities today restrict the number of taxis by requiring each taxi to have a medallion. The cities keep the number of medallions strictly limited. 
taxi medallion in Philadelphia currently costs $400,000, similar to what it costs in Boston or Chicago. In New York City, a medallion costs an individual over $700,000, with a corporate medallion topping in at $1 million. In 1937, one could buy an original taxi medallion in New York City for $10. The price of a medallion, or the price of any license, it reflects the value that the owner of the license places on being in a government-protected monopoly market. Because if the government said anybody could get into the cab business, allow anybody, well then the, the price of a license would be zero, it would mean wouldn't be worth anything. It leads to higher prices, and so the consumers hurt, and it's, uh, it leads to uh, outsiders not being able to get in. And that's the whole point of the medallion system, is to keep insiders in and outsiders out. Americans have lost their love for the United States Constitution, and I believe that either they're ignorant or they have contempt for the United States Constitution. Ignorance is curable, but contempt is not. The Constitution, Article I, uh, Section 8, enumerates the powers of the federal government. And, and the federal government uh, has gone, far, Congress has gone far beyond those enumerated powers. They're going to call him a controversial professor who offended a lot of black people. And they may mention his books, but they won't talk about the profound effect he's had on so many people, black and white, uh, who have read his books and been inspired by him. Walter is one of the few honest academics. And it's harder to be uh, honest in academia than in almost any other place, with the possible exception of politics. He will be remembered as he should be remembered, as one of the great uh, economists, a great human being and one of the most incredible uh, blacks to have come through America in the past uh, 80 years. The mandate in a free society, as Walter understands, is not to give freedom to people who agree with you. The essence of liberty is to allow freedom for people who disagree with you. You can be principled and, and unflexing, un unbendable with your principles and still be successful. And sometimes you have to stand up and it's okay if you have to stand alone. And I think that that's, I think that's kind of a, an unintentioned message that he sends. Sometimes you have to stand alone, but at least you're standing up. When he was in high school, he had an English class and he turned in a research paper when the teacher passed back the papers, she got to Walter's desk and she tore the paper into four pieces and dropped it on his desk. And she says, rewrite the whole paper. And he always pointed out, he said, that was one of the most influential teachers of his life because she didn't make excuses for his failure. She demanded excellence because she believed in him. And that's the key. One of uh, Pop's statements used to be that chance and opportunity uh, uh, don't come by very often, but when they do come by, when the opportunity train does come by, don't be in a position of saying, wait, let me go pack my bags. Always be ready uh, for opportunity.